please welcome back Bertrand Bonello. So the film is an adaptation, but a very loose and free one. Can you talk a little bit about the Henry James story? That, and when you encountered it, when you thought it would be a film, and... Yeah, um, first of all, I really wanted to do a, a melodrama. And uh, the melodrama drove me to this novel, which is on my desk for like 10 or 15 years. And uh, it's, for me, one of the most um, heartbreaking, beautiful and awful novel. Um, uh, because you can beat it in terms of melodrama. I mean, melodrama is what? It's just uh, two people, everyone knows they should be together except them, and they realize when it's too late. And this is. That's your definition of melodrama? Yes, it is. <laughs> <laughs> And and uh, and in the Henry James novel, it's in 50 pages. It's it's this and it's beautiful. And the heart of the novel is which I took yep. uh, is I cannot fall in love because there is a beast that's going to destroy everything. And when the person I exchange the role, it's a man, but realizes that uh, the beast is only the fear of love. It's too late. So. I took this this argument. I put most of it in the first scene in the ballroom uh, in 1910, and then after I exploded it. Uh, but I kept two things: fear and love. How they m go so well together, and I wanted to 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 go further in fear. And then I wrote the uh, 2014 part, which is almost a slasher, you know. Uh, uh, so a kind of cinema of fear. And then I went a little further and wrote the 2044 uh, to have this kind of concept that you have a dilemma, uh, which is to choose between having like a great job or losing your emotion. And it's all this kind of path in my, in my head that drove me to the, to the script and to this uh, structure. Yeah, I mean, it's a fascinating um, story to have as a starting point because it's the defining thing about that, about the James uh, uh, short story, I think it's just this sense of dread and anticipation and a fear of what might happen. And I'm, I'm interested in how that, that, that as a mood seems extremely cinematic. So, you know, the film seems to be more like, um, not so much an adaptation of the book, but like a distillation of its mood. Mm. Yeah, I, I took, as I said, the, the, the argument, and then this argument gives, you know, it like it opens so many doors um, to images, to, to uh, other stories, and the film, it's exactly that. It's a door that opens a door that opens a door that opens a door that comes from only one thing. There is a beast. What is the beast? With this only simple sentence, the only uh, very simple two words together, fear and love, you can you can especially in movies, open so many doors and have so many images that are coming. I wanted to ask you um, to say a bit about the two actors. Um, Leia Seydoux, somebody you, you do know, and um, I assume you had her in mind for the film. Um, the film we noticed at the end is, of course, dedicated to an actor you worked with, Gaspar Uliel, who, who passed away a few years ago. So I, the idea was for Leia and Gaspar to be in the film together? Yes, it was really a film for, for, for the two of them, which I, I, I know Gaspar was here like uh, nine years ago uh, for, for Saint Laurent. Um, Leia, it's quite simple. I mean, I, I think she's the only French actress that could be in the three parts uh, in 1910, 14, and, and in the future. Um, She's timeless in a way. Uh, she's very modern and very timeless. And also, uh, even if I know her very well, when you look at her, um, you don't know what's in her mind. And this kind of mystery, I mean, camera loves it. So she was the perfect uh, part for that. And then Gaspar, yes, for me, it was obvious that I was writing for him. And, and so he passed away like a few weeks before uh, 
the shooting was about to start. So uh, we decided uh, with uh, Justin, the, the, the producer, uh, to still do the film, to postpone it, and to replace uh, Gaspar by uh, not by a French actor, not to have a, a kind of comparison or something. So I started a very classical um, casting process, meeting American and, and British actors for a few months. And then I met George, uh, George Mackay. Uh, I went to see him in London. And after like five minutes, I knew he was the, he was the guy. I, 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 I could find in him some very uh, uh, similar qualities, human qualities in Gaspar. But besides that, his game was his acting was just great, so I brought him back to France. I wanted to see him and Leah together, and for me the couple was perfect. It's the same film and it's not the same film. Mm -hmm. And for me, George made the film possible again. Were you looking for something in the male character that you said, you know, about Leah, somebody who could exist in three time periods, or were you looking for something else with the with the male character? I wasn't looking for anything, you know, things appear little by little. Mm -hmm. And uh, for example, now the film is finished, I, 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 can, I can see that Lea, though she uh, has very different, uh, diff different looks through the periods, in a way she's, she's the same. And George is like very, very different. Exactly, yeah. And I like this kind of uh, different things about the actors. It's not something I decided, it's something that happened because of them and because of, you know, it's so mysterious how films are made. Yeah. No, it's part of the effect of the film, I think, um, how he's so completely malleable and she somehow... Yeah, she's really like keeping something through the ages and is very, very, very different. And I, I, I like the, the differences between the two. Yeah. Um, I wanted to ask, obviously, about the structure of the film. Um, I think one of the... For me, one of the defining aspects of your films is how they work with time, even when they're set in a, you know, even a film like Nocturama, which is set over a day, has very interesting decisions about how time is felt in the film. And um, you've made a period piece before with La, La Polonide, um, House of, of Pleasures, which also has a little bit of an anachronistic um, aspect to it. And here I think it's very interesting, given how you've worked with, with temporality in your other films, to see you working in three different time periods. So I'm wondering if you can say just a bit about the, that decision. The, the 1900 seems closest to Henry James, of course, but then to have the other two and, and, and a little bit about each, each, each setting. I think cinema is great to play with time, time and space, of course, but uh, mainly time. And I've always, I, I mean, I've been doing this f very much in the, in the last films, uh, House of Pleasure in here, uh, but also Saint Laurent. I wanted to push it a little further, uh, going through ages in a way. Um, because it's, uh, it, 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 it calls, Ghosts, it calls a lot of things that are really amazing for films. Um, so how I, I I try to to it's not mathematical. It's very sensitive. In fact, you know, uh, you have your three stories, and then how you put them together. The most difficult thing is to 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 be sure that at the end you 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 won't have three stories. You just have one. You don't have three characters. You just have one. Uh, so it's how you make uh, every story like independent and being part of like a big story. That was the most challenging work on the script. Can you talk about the, um, I guess, the period section? Um, this you're referring to an actual flood, right? That's an actual event that happened yeah. in Paris, and I, I guess I'm just wondering about the process of figuring out that time period, like was it close to how you were working with period in, in La Polonide or? Yeah, I mean, uh, I was always trying in every period to mix like uh, intimate catastrophe and collective catastrophe. Uh, so in 1910, we had this huge flood, which is quite impressive. And uh, from that, like in La Polonide, in a House of Pleasure, I, I, I do a lot, a lot of research to be very, very precise. And in in 2014, it's it's the same anyway. The uh, the, the uh, collective catastrophe 
could be, it's not an earthquake, it's just like a kind of more dramatic amnesia uh, due to, to the way of, you know, you show yourself to the world through social medias and stuff like that. And as the real flood in 1910, I, I had this real character, American character called Elliot Roger, that is the one that posted these videos before killing girls. And all the iPhones videos that George makes, uh, it's actually real stuff that I just, you know, I didn't write these dialogues. I, I wouldn't be able to, to write myself these dialogues. Um, and in 2044, we could say that the major catastrophe, that there is no more catastrophe, you know? So it's maybe the, 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 you're losing the, 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 the fact of being alive. Uh, and uh, well, this is future, so there's nothing real yet, but I think we're just not so far from it. I wanted maybe for you to dwell a bit more on the, on the 2014 um, sections, um, which you described as a, a slasher. I, I, I guess it sort of is, and I mean, it is the genre in which, you know, the fear of what might happen <laughs> is like the, what defines a slasher. So I'm curious what you were trying to do with, you know, Within within the genre, and also like how you wanted to to play with it or to expand it, were you thinking of specific films or specific motifs? Well, 2014 is something that we've seen in like many films. You have like a beautiful girl alone in a house and someone outside. Uh, I guess the only film I just watched again is a film called When Stranger Calls, Fred Walton, which I, a film I really love. Not very famous, but. And after that, you try to, to, to invent. You know, how can you invent kind of motives after so many films? Uh, so uh, I had this idea that all comes from a machine and the machine bugs. And the end of 2014, you, you can see that nothing works, even in, 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 in the mise en scène, in a way. You know? um, but what I like when you do like a uh, very classical uh, motif is you have to, to find ideas to, to just to make, to, f to find something a little different, you know. Um, and can you say a little bit about the future? I don't think you've ever made something set in the future before, right? This? It's the first yeah. and the last time. <laughs> <laughs> What? Inventing the future is like very difficult. <laughs> Can you say what you know a little? It's interesting. It's a future that's only like twenty years. Yeah, it's tomorrow. Away. But now you know. I think it, in the film is two thousand forty-four. I really think I made a mistake. I should have put two thousand twenty-seven. <laughs> Things are moving fast. So. <laughs> no, but when I started to write this film, like. Uh, Four or five years ago, uh, I, I worked with a, uh, someone very that knew AI very well, and so I was aware of many things, many dangers. Uh, most of the dangers, in fact, are not, not technological. They are ethical, morals. They are politicals. But now, in t this year, the film is finished and going to be released, and I was I couldn't imagine that AI would be like the headlines of so many papers this year, you know, during the spring. I mean, it was like the major danger of the future, you know. The guy who created that said, I created something much more dangerous than the atomic bomb. Uh, mm -hmm. And in a way, it could be dangerous because if these ethical, moral, and political problems are not solved, yes, we create a tool, but the tool is going to be stronger than us and it, we, we should be, be stronger than a tool and now I, I when I presented the film in, in Venice and Toronto there was in America this huge strike with screenwriters and and actors and AI the use of AI in art was the heart of the negotiations so yes in a way it's quite contemporary at that at that uh, point but uh, when I said it's it's difficult to imagine the future is you, when I do 1910, it's a lot of work, but you have a lot of documents, you just reproduce stuff, you don't invent things. So what do we, how can you invent the future? Uh, uh, usually in science fiction, you have like two directions. One of them is like the 
ultra technological you know direction and one of them is like the post apocalyptic direction and i wanted to try something a little different and as you said it's it's only in 20 years so in 20 years i mean this building will be here will be the same you know the the streets will be there so so i decided to 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 to, to show the world as it is but to change behaviors much more than um visual things and to take away to take away mm -hmm. there is no more screens no more internet no more commercials no more cars and no more interaction between people when when uh, leah talks to her friend it's just like a voice uh this is how i try to set it up um and this can you talk a little bit about um shooting in america yeah well it's quite easy because we did not uh, <laughs> Well, we did, did like did a, 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 couple a couple of, of yeah, a couple pickup. of nights in, in in Los Angeles when she drives and stuff like that. But basically, everything was shot in France, in the south of France. But I think the idea of America today is very present in the film, and I'm wondering about you know the decision to sh set that part to deal with that particular real life case and your. But Interesting. It, it comes from the fact that I decided to use Elliot Rogers' uh, material. So, of course, for me, it's so it's such an American uh, character. Uh, <laughs> did I say something I shouldn't have said? <laughs> what I mean is, it's, it's factual. We do we do have serial killers in France, okay? <laughs> But they do not say the same things. It's what I meant. That's all. Every country has serial killers. You're not the only one, okay? But yours are more spectacular. It's a good thing, you know? So, I don't want to say that your country creates this kind of person, but this kind of putting themselves in mise en scène, yes, a little. But you're the, you're the country of fiction, you know? So, that's why everything is fiction, even reality. Okay. <laughs> so, that's what I made in my mind. So I decided that the second part would be in America. And of course there is something like America, Los Angeles cinema, everything works together in, in a kind of uh, unconscious collective, which is very, very, very strong, of course. It's late and I think we only have time for one more question, but I, I feel like I have to ask you to at least say a little bit about something that's always very important to your films, which is music. Um, and maybe you can also tie in a little bit about the, the nightclub scenes which recur throughout the film. It's true that I really, really love making club scenes. It's very difficult, uh, uh, but there is something so uh, full of energy, full of uh, 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 emotion, I think. Um, uh, it's not only picking up the good song and the good location, it's working on, on, on the extras and stuff like that. And for example, I, I really like the idea that in 2044, everyone is very, very alone. And you have a free zone, a free zone in which you finally meet people. And you recreate like theater, you know, uh, periods. Uh, so it's uh, the choice of music in my, in my scripts come very, very early during the writing. And each song, uh, not only the music I do, but each song that is in the film has a special meaning, not my affective meaning, I like this song, but a meaning for the character and what it has to say in the actual scene. I'm afraid we're out of time, but I'm, I want to thank you for being here with us and for this film. Thank, thank you very thank much. Thank you so much. Thank you.